Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome technical fellow, Microsoft, Eric Gamma. Good morning. You know, I was 100% sure I will never show up at the Java conference since I joined Microsoft six years ago. But here I am, right? It's cool to be here. And what I want to do with you, I want to show you kind of what made that possible and what learnings I made along this journey since I uh, joined Microsoft. The goodness starts, of course, at Eclipse, right? Cool project. I was really lucky to be on that project because it did many things right. But it also was a great learning opportunity, right? Eclipse, everything is a plugin. Everything gets loaded in one process. All extensions are written in Java. That was a great learning opportunity. And see, Eclipse is still alive, right? You still use it. And that's a cool thing. So then, of course, I made my first pivot. I left Java behind me and jumped over to JavaScript. Well, actually, more precisely, TypeScript. And the mission of my team at that time was explore how far you can push programming in the browser. Okay? So what we did, we built a high-performance web-based editor. And we learned a lot there about how to make this fast, right? how you work with the DOM, how you leverage web workers. Because the goal is, if you program in a browser, you don't want to notice that you're in a browser. So this has made its way into many products and was a great learning opportunity. Then, of course, Microsoft is all about dog fooding. Right? Building an editor in the browser is fine, but you have to use it yourself. Obviously, the way to do that is you build more tools around it. You build a little ID around uh, the editor. And this is what we did next. So we built what we call the Online Monaco, which was basically an IDE uh, that runs in a browser. And again, a great learning opportunity, because what we learned there is that developers like the portability of the browser. But if you do hardcore coding, it's not clear that you want to do this all in the browser. So at this point, we decided to pivot. We moved away from running all in the browser. But what we did is we took our technology with us. So we had our highly tuned editor. Uh, it written in JavaScript, TypeScript, HTML, took it with us, and planned to build it as a desktop app using the Electron shell from GitHub. The question then was, what product do we build? Because what we saw is that born in the web developers, they love editors. They not only love it, they're incredibly fast at it, right? Because they, they know the keyboard shortcut. They're very lightweight. They start up fast. When I say lightweight, I think of Sublime, right? They're very fast. You open a file folder, and they're all polyglot, right? The web phone developers, they work in many languages. On the other hand, we have IDEs. They bring along more smartness, which has some weight, like wizards. Uh, they have code understanding. They can debug. They can have designers, right? Graphical tools. So what we said, what we tried to find is the sweet spot between editors and IDEs, but closer to editors. So we haven't forgotten our heritage of Eclipse, right? We love some stuff from there, like code understanding and debug. So what we did is we went out and built an editor based on our HTML technology, which we called Visual Studio Code, which is, of course, you know, by now is open source, as is the Monaco editor, and it's cross-platform. I still remember the cool moment when we could show a Microsoft tool running on Linux, right? It was the first Microsoft tool that was running on Linux. So what's very clear, if you want to build such an editor, you need extensions. You need lots of them. I told you, you know, Eclipse did many things right. They had lots of extensions. There is one thing which we learned from Eclipse is if you run all the extensions in the same process, you're vulnerable. Because if one extension misbehaves, one extension takes long to start up then your tool becomes sluggish. Okay? So you want to avoid that. So our trick there was we said, OK, we run the extensions not in the same process, but in a separate process. If you think about it, it could be think of um, we host 
uh, extensions in isolation in a separate process which talks about RPC to the main core of the IDE and it's still fast enough. So that was the first important learning, right? But we had another challenge. We had this long tail languages challenge, right? Polyglot developers want support for many languages. We say we love code understanding. So how do we get deep language support for many languages? So it's not enough to have just extensions. You need to have deep support for many languages. And that brings us to the idea of language servers, right? Imagine you build a Java language support in different tools. Developers like choice these days, right? There will always be Vim developers. Vim will always be the best Vim. There is Eclipse. There is Visual Studio Code. So what do you do if you want to build Java language support for that? In the past, the way you did it, you had to build it for each tool. You had to use the tool API to integrate in that. If the language, the tool was written in JavaScript, for instance, you write the, the, the language support in JavaScript, and so on. Big problem, right? High costly, and um, doesn't make you fast to get this many languages. So that's why we like this appeal of language servers, right? A language server just encapsulates the language know-how in a server process, and the cool thing is the different tools, the editors, can then just integrate this language server, which is a great win for the language provider, but not for the tool hoster, because the tool hoster still has to integrate all these languages, language servers, in the tool. So for this reason, we said we want to go one step further and say we not only build language servers, we want to have language servers which use a common protocol, right? And in 2016, we announced the language server protocol, which is a very, um, actually a simple protocol which allows a tool to talk to language server through some JSON RPC protocol. And it's very simple, right? Basically, the protocol is tells you Actually, a document got opened, which knows the language server, okay, the truth of the document is now in memory, right? So honor that. When there is a change, the tool tells the language server, hey, there is a change, update your internal data structure, ASTs, whatever, report diagnostics as needed. And when you do a semantic query, like what is the definition of a symbol, you just make a request at this document, at this position, where is the definition for the symbol underneath it? So what you see here, it's, it's a very high-level, UI-level protocol, which allows us to really abstract many of the intrinsics of a language, because we don't talk about ASTs. We don't talk about parsing. We only talk about documents and positions, which I think is one ingredient to make this thing successful. And the cool thing is, it was successful, right? People have come, they followed us, and actually they uh, implemented language servers. And one really cool one is the Eclipse language server, right? Which allows me to be here, right? So basically, we have a Java extension for Visual Studio Code, which is powered by Eclipse. It's basically a headless version of Eclipse, which takes just the plugins from Eclipse, which don't use UI, packages them up, implements the language server protocol, and this brings us the Java language server and the Java extension. Actually, there's more to that. People like to build language servers. Pivotal likes it too because they like to give choice to the developers. So they built now the Spring Boot for Java support as a language server, which means it's applicable, usable for different editors like Eclipse, Atom, what have you. Okay. I will demo it in a second. So let's switch to demo, right? That's kind of the prize for me giving a talk. Always the same. I want to do a demo. Okay, what I want to demo with you is a simple application which uses Spring Boot, of course. Uh, it was uh, generated with one of the Spring Boot starters. It's powered in the back end by Azure, by Azure database called Cosmos, which is one of the scalable non-SQL document DBs. And basically, it's a, it's a to-do list application, right? And as you see, my big to-do is refresh my Java skills, since I must say I forgot many, many things in the last six years. And the other to do is, of course, I have to install the Spring Boot Java support extension, which is nice. OK, let's switch over to code. As I mentioned, Visual Studio Code is a lot about extensions. So let me show you what extensions I've installed here. I've installed some Azure extensions, then lots of love coffee cup extensions, right? You see here Java extensions, an extension pack that bundles the other Java extensions, like the language server, like the 
debugger, and you just last Friday announced the extension for JUnit test running for, for Java. And also at the bottom, you see the Spring Boot for Java extension, which makes programming with Spring Boot uh, more pleasant, improves navigation, insights into your applications, and so on. OK. So let's dive into the code, right? But before doing that, let's quickly go here, right? We have here the Azure Cosmos DB. We have an extension that gives us access to the database to show it that it's really powered by Azure. I open in the portal. And that's the Azure portal, which shows that's the database that drives all that. It's a document DB, which actually, by the way, also understands the Mongo, the protocol, and you see my to-do and refresh my Java skills, because I'm way behind. OK, let's start to navigate the source code. A good starting point for this app is always the controller, right, which has lots of the interaction navigation. So let's do that. And I want to go to all the symbols in my workspace. And I do that. It's a to-do list controller, right? I could do it this way by just knowing the name of the symbol, if I can type. Or what I can now do with the, the Spring Boot extension, I can say I want to go to a bean, right? I go, for instance, to the to to-do list controller bean, navigate there, and here I am in Java, right? Inside the file, I can do the same thing again, navigate in the file if I want to at the symbol level or at the Spring level by navigating to all the request mappings. Like, I can go to the post request, which I think is interesting, because something interesting must happen there. It's a request mapping. Now you see here, we are in Visual Studio Code. You get hovering as you expect, which is all powered by, by Eclipse, right? The know-how, how to compute that, that's all done in the Eclipse language server. So, and you see here, when I create a new to-do list item, it just uses the Spring uh, repository abstractions, does a save on it, which will, behind the scene, then update the Cosmos database DB. Good. So let's navigate around a little bit further, right? So there is a to-do item. Let's navigate there. So you see what we have here. We have reference code lens, we call that, right? That allows us to find the reference to an item. So that's fairly silly model object, right? You see here, by the way, we support ligatures. And I always think something is wrong if you don't have three equals. But it's just a sign to me that I forgot that I'm in Java, not in JavaScript, right? So let's look at some references. Like is finished. And yes, see, that's in an assertion item. That's where I feel at home, right? When it comes to Java, it's feeling like coming home. When it comes to unit tests, then I really feel at home, right? So let's go to this test and see what we can do here. OK, that's a test finished. Tests whether the to-do item is finished, the, log it, log, uh, the logic there. I think I can improve this test by also validating the, the, the precondition, right? Assert that. And you see you get IntelliSense as expected. Uh, what is it? Is not true, right? Probably one more. OK. OK, that should do it. And you see, you get squiggles, all the stuff you use from Eclipse. You also can do extract method if you want, right? You get light bulb extract method. It's always the same because, well, it's powered by Eclipse behind the scene. So I've written this test. You see some other code lines here. I can also run the test now, right? Like we like this in context action, like peak and stuff. You saw that. I run the test, and it turns actually green, which gives me confidence. OK, good stuff, right? I have a unit test running embedded, can navigate around, and so on. So enough testing and running. By the way, just one feature which, which shows our, our, how much we like the in-context thing. You always get kind of in-context diff information, right? We show in-context what's the diff. You can stage it on Git, undo it, and so on, whatever you want. And of course, also here you get uh, notifications. Good. So done. So let's show you how we debug the whole thing. For that, we have to build it. And we have a task abstraction VS Code. So I have task. Let's package this whole thing, which runs an M uh, Maven task in our terminal. It's done. So let's also run the thing. 
and we want to start the server. Okie doke. Then we go and launch it. We attach the debugger. We switch over to the browser. We go to our app. Of course, the standard to do item in demos is get milk. We add it. And we hit the debugger, right? We're in a debugger as you expected. And we can hover over values. Happy, right? So you see, if you can do it all with an edit that's lightweight, that starts fast, is still um, keyboard driven, folder based, and supports many languages. So we have enough confidence to running it locally. Now comes the deployment. Let's deploy it. And I want to deploy it to two, uh, to two targets. One is to Azure uh, using a Docker and then a a web app, and of course, I'm going to also publish it to Cloud Foundry using this famous CF push that will use CF. So, in the previous talk, okay, I do that. Go to the tasks. I have a task to to Docker build and push, and I have a task. I let them run in parallel, but we will not wait for them, right? To to push to Cloud Foundry, which will do nothing else than a CF push. And now we could watch it running, and then I could show you that it really got deployed, but we know this will work. So I hope I could give you a brief tour on uh, what is possible with this kind of tool and how we could connect the dots and how I could come up back here at the Java conference and show you uh, that it's possible, actually, to also do Java development in a, such a tool like Visual Studio Code, which is a really polyglot tool which supports many languages and should be fun to program. So that was it. Maybe one quick go back to the slides. There is actually more. There are more sessions on this whole Azure integration and so on that you can look to. I want to leave it at that. And all I want to wish you, go home, install Visual Studio Code, install the Java extension pack, and happy coding. Thank you.